Nothing more powerful than the power, prestige, and the leadership of a mom. And today what I would love to do is to take a look at four amazing moms whose lives share a principle that's applicable to all of us. It's a transforming principle that can really make major impact in our lives when life is unraveling or when when life heats up. Anybody ever had your life heat up on you? And I'm not talking about menopause, ladies. I'm just saying, (laughs) anybody ever had your life unravel and things heat up? Well, we're going to learn from these ladies what it looks like to remain faithful. So the first person we look at has a name, a book written after her name, and it's, of course, Ruth. And Ruth begins with the story of her mom, Naomi. Naomi has uh, two daughters, uh, or two sons, I'm sorry, and they had to move away uh, to, because of a drought. So they moved a, a, a away, and during this uh, drought, uh, her boys get married. And so she now has two daughters-in-law, and of course, that's Orpah and Ruth. Well, uh, as life unravels in their life and the heat turns up, um, all, the, all the husbands die. And so now Naomi is left with her daughters-in-law, and they are in a foreign land. And so now they're like, what do we do here? And it's a really tough place for these women to be because back then they uh, were not respected as women are today, could not have jobs, and so they would have had a really hard time making a way. And so, so Naomi says to her daughters-in-laws, why don't you go back home to Moab because I'm going to go back home to Bethlehem, and you can't go back to Bethlehem because the Jewish men would not marry you. They would not respect you. So it's better for you to go back to to Moab. But Ruth makes a decision that's very interesting. Ruth makes a decision that goes against what's practical, that what what seems to be in her best interest. Uh, Come on, that's motherhood, is it not? I mean, I just think about moms, and so often what you guys are having to do is go against what seems to be practical for your own life, for the benefit of of your kids' lives. You definitely push up against what's most convenient. You often choose not what's convenient, but what shows love and what protects and what rides beside your kids. And so this is what Ruth does, and it pushes away for what seems to be in her best interest. So she decides to go back to Bethlehem with Ruth. And so she makes a decision in favor for a spiritual reality that says, my God shall be your God. This is what Ruth says to Naomi. And she makes a decision to cling to her faith, even though it doesn't appear to be her best interest. She makes a decision not to go back with her sister, Orpah, who decided to go back to Moab, the only family that she had left. She went back. She decided to, to, to push away from Orpah and go and stay with her mother. So essentially what she decided was not to follow her fear, but rather follow her faith. And so the question for all of us would be is when when things heat up, when things are unraveling, do we follow our fear or do we follow our faith? And we see this amazing woman, Ruth, she follows her faith. So she goes back to Bethlehem um, and there in Bethlehem one day, she's gleaning uh, in the field, serving her mother-in-law, Naomi, when a man named Boaz sees her, come on, that's a, uh, that's a great name, isn't it? That's a strong name, Boaz. And Boaz is like, hello, I'd like to get to know Ruth, little baby Ruth. Like, I'd like to get to know Ruth. Now, now Boaz is a lot older than Ruth, okay? But Boaz is also very wealthy. And it's important to note that Ruth wasn't like parading herself out trying to find a man. She was actually being faithful to her mother-in-law. She was being faithful to her role uh, and her calling. And and watch what God does. The the net result of this encounter is in in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. It says, uh, 
So, so Boaz takes interest in Ruth. They start dating, essentially. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Okay, so we have a mother-daughter a scenario here because uh, Naomi is too old to have babies. Her husband's passed. Her two daughters-in-law at the time could not have babies, but now through a series of events, the supernatural takes place, and the Lord gave her conception. But this isn't the end if you continue in the story. And it says, And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they accredited to Naomi what she didn't have because her daughter-in-law had what she couldn't have. That's what's going on here. And they named him Obed. His father was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So the thing didn't work out first for Ruth. The first time, she wasn't able to get pregnant. Then her husband dies. She makes a decision to honor. She makes a decision to follow her faith instead of her fear. When the things actually heat up in her life, she still remains faithful. And little did she know that God would raise up a man who was rich and old but wasn't cold. Come on, somebody. (laughs) And she got pregnant with Obed, okay? Y'all with me? She got pregnant with Obed, who becomes the father of Jesse, who becomes the father of David, through whose lineage comes the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, I'm here to tell you today that when the heat turns up, if you'll push away from your fear and follow your faith, the Lord has your back. You can trust him. He is trustworthy. And Ruth shows us what this looked like. And our moms show us what faith looks like when it pushes up against them and things get heated and things seem to be unraveling. Moms, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you. We are the fruit of your faithfulness. So thank you for your faithfulness. If Ruth had gone back to Moab, she would have missed Boaz. And if Ruth would have missed Boaz, um, Obed, she would have missed Obed. Uh, and and if, if she would have missed Obed, then Obed would have missed Jesse. And Jesse would have missed David. And on and on, she would have been out of the blessing of being a part of the lineage of David. She made a faith decision when she could not see a solution in advance. And that is what faith is. And that's what this series is. We're talking about the way of freedom when we can't see in advance. God still wants us to still, you remember last week, to push away from the couch. Those little shaky knees. We got to push away from the couch, push away from the comfort. And this is what Ruth shows us. So, so what I would say, and we're going to just hear this repeated in all four of these ladies' lives, these women's lives, is be patient. Be patient because God's patience is perfect for you. Now, I can mess up even in trying to be patient. Anybody got I'm complacent in patience? Yeah, we can get complacent in our, in our patience, but, but God's patience is perfect for us. And if you don't feel like he's going to answer, he's not answering, or he's taking too long, listen, be patient because God's patience is, perf- patience is perfect for you. Let's talk about another mom, an amazing mom, mom named Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, Hannah is barren. She can't have children. Why can't she have children? Well, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 15 tells us, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So she was also in an unpleasant environment. She wanted so badly to be a mom. She wanted so badly to be able to bear children, but she wasn't able to, to at the time because the Lord had closed her womb. And so all the other women mocked her. All the other women uh, disregarded her and set her aside. So Hannah carries a lot of shame because Hannah couldn't carry a child. And I know that there's probably some of us here today that you might carry shame because maybe you can't carry a child or you maybe carry a lot of shame because you can't carry the thing that you feel like you were born to carry, that you were made to carry. But we're gonna learn how to remain faithful when things seem to be unraveling. Verse seven tells us that she tried year after year, but she could not get pregnant. Year after year. You just can imagine 
the, the roller coaster. I know that there are many women here that know exactly that roller coaster of, of the ups and downs of, of not being able to be, get pregnant. So 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, we see what Hannah does. It says, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Can I just say to you that the Lord hears your cries? In fact, the scripture tells us that every tear that comes out of your eyes, he bottles up. Like every tear. And I know that in the evenings or late at night or in the car or in the bathroom when no one's looking, you think no one knows. But the one who's most important knows. The Lord has compassion for you. The Lord loves you. So she is weeping bitterly and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And so she is so desperate and she goes to God and asks God to reverse the way things have been all of her adulthood. So what happens? Verse 19. Though, uh, they rose early in the morning and they worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Now, why is this so important? Well, the Lord was the one who closed her womb, which means the Lord was the only one who could open her womb. And God continues, if you just read on, to bless Hannah. She has three sons and two daughters. I mean, just incredible. So what I would encourage you today is here we are again. Be patient because God's patience is perfect for you. Hey, moms, be patient because God's patience is perfect for you. Sons and daughters, be patient because God's patience is perfect for you. Let's look at another one. Stay with me. All of these are going to come to a perfect um, place for us to really grab a hold of. I don't know about you. Even as I'm reading and hearing about these first two amazing women, my faith is always challenged because there's been times when I've bailed out for a lot less. There's been times where I got impatient and, and, and went ahead of God instead of waiting for God. There's been times where I tried to make a way because I thought God was late. How many of you guys know that God's never, never late? He's always on time. He's an on-time God. And so if he's delaying, he's delaying for your good. If he's delaying, he's preparing you. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe I'm not ready for what he's about to do. And maybe what you want him to do, he's going to use the want, your want to to do something inside of you before he maybe gives you what you want. And maybe the thing that you think you want is not actually what you really need. And the process of having to wait is going to provide to you what you really need. Come on, I've seen that in my life. The thing I think I want I pray for it, I wait for it, I, 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 I press in prayer and I get frustrated, but all the while, God's doing a work on the inside of me. And so I just wanna encourage you, here we are again, be patient because God's patience is perfect for you. Here's the third amazing woman of God, the widow of Zarephath, okay? There was a drought. And in 1 Kings 17, we see the prophet Elijah goes and asks this widow for some food, beginning in verse 12. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Now that's a pretty tough day. When you wake up knowing this was your last meal, that you wake up knowing like, hey, this is all I got left. And isn't it like a preacher to ask for whatever she's got left? That's what Elijah does. Elisha comes and says, hey, I know you don't have much, but trust God with it. I know you don't have much. And I can just imagine this moment as she has little, but the prophet comes and says, hey, I, don't, I know you don't have much, 
but I still want you to go to do uh, what I told you to do. Uh, verse 13, here's, here's Elijah's response. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said. In other words, go make it and die, <laughs> but first make me a cake and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. And, and so he says, okay, go ahead, but I want you to exercise your faith First, I want you to put a little bit aside, set a portion aside for the prophet, okay? So you can just imagine this. And the Bible says she did what the prophet told her to do, and the flour wasn't spent, and the oil didn't run out, just as he said. So if she would have denied the prophet, the prophet's request, and insisted, like, no, I don't have enough for myself. How can I give you something? She would have missed this miracle. And I want you to notice that God didn't just provide just to get her through the day, which is all she had left. The minute she trusted God through the prophet, what happened? She had more than enough. And she had enough to get her through the drought. So God will take your little and make it a lot when you trust him. Okay, final lady, the widow, and we'll bring some common application to all of this. Another widow in 2 Kings chapter four, beginning in verse one. Uh, now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. So he says, what do you have in your house? Nothing but a jar of oil. And basically, hey, go to your neighbors and empty with empty vessels not, and not just a few. I want you to go and take empty vessels and go borrow some oil from your neighbors, whatever they'll give you. And so... All she has left is the emptiness of her neediness. Can I just say that I'm learning in my life that that's a great place to remain? Just the emptiness of our neediness. Just knowing that, I, that, that God is my only source and that without him, I am nothing. So, so how do I remain empty? Can I just tell you, faith makes room. Faith makes room. And when I'm saying empty, I'm not saying that you're deplete of power or you're deplete of something. I'm saying that you make room with your faith, that you, you step out and you, little, you leave a little God gap. In, in obedience, you go, God, I am gonna push away from the couch and now this little God gap between what I was holding on for security or comfort, what did I do? I just made room. I just made room for God to show up. And I just wonder for some of us, there's areas in our lives where we need God to move, but we're leaving no God gap. We're depending on ourselves and we're leaning on our own understanding and we're depending on our own strength. And all the while, God is saying, give me something to work with. Make a little room. Faith makes room. Tell your neighbor that right now. Faith makes room. Faith makes room. So keep providing room. Keep, keep making room. And that's exactly what this widow do, does. So God will only take you as far as your faith will allow you to go. He will only take you as far as your faith will allow you to go. So if you're frustrated in an area in your life where you feel like God is failing you or you feel like things are unraveling or you think, feel like things, maybe just maybe there's a step of faith you need to take. Maybe just maybe you, you, you haven't made room because you're not trusting God. And, and it's not one of those situations. I, I've seen in my own life that there's times where God's wanting to move, but I want him to move through my strength. And he goes, nope, I don't do it that way. I want him to do it through my knowledge and my understanding. He says, nope, I don't do it that way. I want him to do it my way. And God says, no, I do it my way. So you gotta, you gotta make that faith step. So 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 7, she came and told the man of God and she said, go sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on 
the rest. And so what we learn here, come on, is there's enough in your jar for the job. Someone should just write that down. There's enough in my jar for the job. Hey, moms, God gave you those kids. There's enough in your jar for the job. You, you have, he wouldn't have trusted you with those kids. There's enough in the jar for the job. There's enough in the jar. But here's what's amazing. How did that jar get filled? Faith. You got to make room. And so we can walk around with our empty jars and hold on to our comfort and do it our way and our jars will remain empty. But the minute we step out, what happens? We make the God gap and God fills the jar. And there's enough in your jar for the job when you're walking in faith and you're trusting God. And so we learn this from this very faithful woman. Be patient because God's patience is perfect for you. So, so what do all these four women have in common? They have a lot in common. First, they're all in crisis. In every crisis situation, uh, in order for the crisis to change, a couple of things had to happen, okay? First, they had to minister to someone else. Did you notice that? For their situation to change, they actually had to get their eyes off, their cell, off themselves and minister to someone else. It was true of Ruth. It was true of Hannah. And it's true of these two widows. They had to do something for someone else. And uh, moms, thank you for being that for us because we'd still all be in dirty diapers and starving if it wasn't for you. We couldn't change our own diapers. I mean, come on. And so uh, we are what we are because you have done something for us. You got your eyes off yourself. And it's just amazing to me how God has wired women. And uh, so many women, you, you, you have this, uh, I think every, every woman, at least every mom that I've talked to, um, never feels like they're adequate enough, especially with that first one. They're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing and I, I'm, I'm so scared. And it's amazing to me how God has wired you guys with these innate uh, abilities and desires and he's, he's put in you, tender, ten, you know, uh, tenderness and he's put in you these, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I just think there's some innate things that take over that are God-given. It's the way that God has wired you. Um, and they had to make a spiritual decision um, to take care of someone else, okay? So these, these women had all this in, 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 in common. And again, I just think that's motherhood, and moms, thank you for that. Um, the, this principle stated in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, given it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for the measure you use, use it will be measured back to you. And I, I just think of my wife and I think about the phenomenal mother that she is and I see how she pours out and pours out into our children's lives. And I, I look at my, my oldest son who's gonna be a senior at Biola. Biola. He's going to Oxford next semester. Um, and, and I just look at my, my next son and he's just uh, graduated essentially yesterday. He got his, all his work. He's going on a, a full ride, uh, or not a full ride, but an academic scholarship to a university. I look at my oldest daughter, and she's already accepted to a great university. I look at our, our 10-year-old, and I just see her growing up to be this, this little lady, and I see the joy on my, my wife's face. It's like just yesterday, uh, when Grayson came home, it's like, I'm officially finished with high school, you know? And I of course, we celebrated with him, but I also took a moment and celebrated with her because you know what? Given, it'll be given to you. And that, our kids are her crown. Our, our kids are, are her blessing. And, and moms, thank you for, for being that type of, of mom. And, and this is kind of what this principle is talking about. Give, it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. So um, we say around here, we get to give. And this is why. We, we get to give. It's a different perspective, okay? Uh, if you want love, you gotta learn to give love. If you want a good friend, you gotta learn to be a good friend. If you want to get, you gotta learn to give, 
okay? Honestly, if, if you want to, to, to prosper, you have to learn to help others be prosperous, all right? This is just a principle in scripture. And I think our moms are just such a great, great picture of this, of they, they get to give, and it's through their giving that we become prosperous, like, I am not who I am. Mom had problems like every mom had problems. My mom had challenges and wasn't a perfect mom. There's not a perfect mom on the planet. But I'm telling you, the sacrifice that she made for me, hey, man, it was enough for me that she just had me because the pain of that was wow, right? So she's already made great sacrifice. But give and it'll be given to you. And so here I am on the blessing and the receiving end of my mother's sacrifice and my mother's um, giving. And I know that for my mom, I was a blessing to her, but it cost her great sacrifice. And so let's just be sure to honor our moms today and, and give back to them. Let's be a blessing. Let's just not take. Come on, kids. Let's just not take. Let's, let's just learn. Like uh, students, don't, don't be a taker all the time. You need to learn to honor your mom and, and, and shock them even when it's not Mother's Day and say, yes, ma'am, and, 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 and do things that you know she wants you to do in advance, and I promise you, you do that, things will go better for you, okay? Just, just see how your life goes, okay? So we get to give, we don't um, give to get. And sometimes God will block you from getting something if he knows you're not willing to give it to somebody else. We, we, we like to say, like when it comes with giving, and just so you know, in our context as a church, when we talk about giving, um, financial is just that much. Um, we're supposed to give of our lives, of our relationships, of our time, of our talents, of our, our treasures and all those things. And sometimes God will hold back from you because he sees you as a Velcro person versus a Teflon person. And you wonder why, oh, you're not growing and, and you're not you know, advancing in your life. Well, maybe God's holding it back because he, you know, he knows you won't give it away. And you won't bless someone else with how he blesses you. God will always bless those who will bless others. It's, it's just think about it. it. It's smart, isn't it? He's like, who's going to steward it well? I'm going to bless those who bless others, okay? And so in all three of these women's lives, they had tremendous faith. And what we learn is this. And here's our faith application. Faith is measured by feet, not by feelings, Faith is measured by feet, pushing away from the couch, okay? Faith is measured by feet and not by feelings. And the truth is, we won't see God until we believe first. We won't see God show up because we're not giving, we're not making the God gap. Are you with me, okay? And what we learn in, from all these four women of faith is that faith is measured in movement, Okay, it's measured in movement. It's not just, God, I believe up here. God, I love you. I know you're true. I know it's true. God, I sing songs to you. God, I make commitments to you. Where if the commitments never make the, make the, makes them way, themselves out into your feet, then it's not faith. It, it's got to move. You got to create, again, that God gap. Faith must be exercised in order for it to be real. That's why they, saw, they call it what? Walking by it's not sitting in faith. It's walking by faith. And did you notice how quickly each of these women's situations turned around once they ste uh, stepped out in faith? Once you step out in faith in any area of your life, he has the ability to turn around your, si your situation like on a dime. And I've just, I've just seen it. We have an on-time God who can turn it around on a dime over and over and again. Let me just wrap with this final thought. Listen, don't let your circumstances cause you to shrink back and make a move towards God. Don't let when the heat turns up cause you to shrink back, cause you to doubt your God, cause you to weaken in your faith, okay? Um, do you guys know how popcorn pops? Do you wanna know? Somebody say yes. Okay, I need you to, I need you to wanna know. Okay, within the kernel of popcorn is a microscopic drop of water. It's on the inside, okay? And when you put that bag of kernels into a microwave and you start heating it up, okay, 
what you're actually doing is you're heating up that little microscopic drop of water that's on the inside of the curdle. The water heats up and what happens? It creates steam and the steam causes pressure and the pressure finally pushes the kernel open and now all of a sudden it goes from seed to popcorn. And I want you to notice that it's what's happening on the inside that causes the transformation. And I know that at times we allow the heat to impact the outside. But I want to encourage you, when things heat up, when enemies come after you, when things seem hard, let the heat come on the inside and let the Holy Ghost do something with it. Let, let the Holy Ghost uh, do something inside of you. Maybe it creates patience in you. Maybe it trans transforms kindness. Maybe it moves hatred into love. Maybe something on the inside of you. When, when the heat turns up, it's a different way of seeing challenges. It's a different way of having and, and, and seeing when things are unraveled. We can either let it heat us up on the outside and just burn us and be mad and be sensitive to everyone. Ow, oh, ow, ow, oh, ow, ah, right? Or we can allow it to heat up the inside of, a, inside of us and trust the Lord in it. And when the time comes, take a faith step. And it's that faith step, you make that God gap and that, that Holy Spirit steam, come on if you'll let me just say that, will just erupt and transform you. This is what sanctification looks like. This is what it looks like to be transformed in Jesus. Father, I thank you for moms. I thank you for the model of faith that they are. And God, I thank you that today is a day set apart from all of the days that we can honor them. And Father, I pray today that as we studied your word, as we looked at four amazing moms, God, you've challenged my faith this week. You're growing me up. You're making me more like Jesus. And it's oftentimes through heated moments. It's oftentimes through, through the heat of a moment or when it seems like my, my life is unraveling in some way that you give me a choice. Will I trust you? Will I take a faith step and create a God gap? Or will I hold on to my comfort? And will I hold on and hoard what it is that you've given to me in the first place? God, help us all. Help us all to be more like our moms, to be faithful. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.